Good afternoon from Brussels. Uh, I'm Ian Lester from uh, GMF here in Brussels and good afternoon and good morning if you're with us from the other side of the Atlantic. Um, thank you very much for joining us today for this conversation uh, with Ambassador Unel Cevikos, uh, former senior Turkish diplomat and, and longtime friend of GMF, uh, but now uh, in a senior position as a deputy in the Turkish Grand National Assembly from CHP, from the Republican People's Party, Turkey's leading opposition party. And we're really fortunate to have him with us here today to give us some perspective on uh, Turkey's foreign policy priorities as seen from the opposition. And uh, there's no shortage of debate around these issues and especially what they mean in the context of, of um, relations with the United States. GMF has held a number of these debates, but there are many going on um, and it'll be a, a great contribution to that. Um, I'm also very pleased to say we have with us today uh, my Washington-based colleague, Jonathan Katz, who's a senior fellow and also director of our uh, democracy initiatives at GMF. Um, and he'll moderate today, actually. But he asked me just to say a few words of welcome, but also to maybe say a few words uh, to start us off on the issues. And, and let me just make a couple of very, very brief points before turning it over to Jonathan. Um, you know, first of all, when seen from an American perspective, uh, I think we'll all agree U.S.-Turkish relations have never been, a, this has never been an easy relationship to manage. I mean, even in what we might have called the good good days, it was there was no golden age here. This was always tough, maybe for two sovereignty conscious actors, uh, never easy to get on the same page, especially when you're talking about foreign and security policy. And that is mostly what the U.S.-Turkish relationship uh, is about. Uh, there are a lot of complaints on both sides these days. Uh, it's a pretty well-known list, whether it's the S-400 purchase uh, from Russia uh, or it's issues of uh, human rights, democracy, media freedom inside Turkey. Turkey has its own complaints about U.S. policy. Um, and of course, more recently, there have been differences in perspective on policy on the Eastern Med. Uh, we'll talk about all of that. Um, uh, the Biden... Uh, the incoming Biden administration is likely to make a difference on many of these points, and we'll get a chance to discuss those. Um, I think this is likely to be something that the Biden administration will, will focus on and focus on quite early. There is a bipartisan consensus, I would say, uh, around a number of these critiques of Turkish policy. Uh, they will be hard to change, I think. The S-400 issue, there are some creative solutions perhaps, but they're not easy. Um, on the East Med, maybe there's more flexibility to do things. Uh, but I, again, you know, I think there is a very strong feeling, frankly, now on both sides of the Atlantic, that Turkey's very assertive posture in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, has been destabilizing. And that's, that's a separate issue really from the question of the underlying merits of the, of the argument as put by Ankara. In any case, we'll get to talk about that, but the mood of nationalism, which I think we'll all agree is taken hold in the region, certainly isn't making things uh, easier. There may indeed be things beyond the relationship per se that uh, the Biden administration would do that might be of interest and, um, and put something on the table for Ankara. Um, very simply put, I think it's about giving Turkey reassurance and deterrence in a, in a very dangerous regional setting presumably for years to come. Um, that is something very important that the US offers and is often forgotten about. Um, and more, you know, generally, it seems to me that the Biden administration is probably likely to have a different kind of rhetoric when it comes to relations with the Muslim world. I'm sure that will have some appeal in Ankara. And also, of course, um, on the relationship with Iran, sanctions, the nuclear issue, uh, there are probably areas of uh, coming agreement with the new administration there. Lots to talk about. Great to have the ambassador with us today. Thank you again for joining us. And Jonathan, let me turn it over to you. Ian, uh, Ian, thank you for that. And also, I think your observations are are you know spot on about uh, the potential of, of some new opportunities, but also um, the areas that still remain uh, uh, a sore point in transatlantic relations uh, with Turkey. And some issues that are still playing out including at the EU and something that you're seeing in, in Brussels as it relates to, to Turkey. I, I too want to welcome the ambassador who I had a, a ple pleasure to meet many years back uh, when I was uh, working as uh, a staffer in Congress uh, with the Congressional Turkey Caucus uh, way back in the day. 
Um, and I just wanted to, to thank the ambassador who's also now, now, in, uh, now in the political fray as a member of, of parliament. Uh, and uh, one thing I wanted to add, Ian, on top of what you, you started to say too, is that I'm, I'm amazed when, uh, when much more dying, uh, internally, uh, as we saw in the last local led, uh, including the United States, your you know, participation. And uh, we're really thrilled that you can be here today. Uh, one of the things I wanted to add on top of this is that, uh, you know, we're going to have a Q&A session that's going to be coming up as well. And we would ask uh, participants to, uh, to go to the Q&A function in Zoom uh, and pose questions to, to the ambassador. Um, and uh, I just want to highlight that, that you, you know, that you've been ambassador in, in a number of countries as well uh, when you were part of the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I, I think you, 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 know, you, you bring a breadth of um, experience in the Black Sea region to the South Caucasus um, and, uh, and beyond that's really important to the conversation that we're gonna have today, including, in, including Iraq uh, as well and your, uh, your uh, old Hat as ambassador to the UK. So, uh, what one of the things that I wanted to ask you first, ambassador, uh, was was about the um, about Turkey's grand foreign policy strategy from the perspective of of CHP of the opposition. I mentioned that Turkey is not monolithic. Um, it's in fact quite a dynamic political, domestic political scene. Um, and your party did quite well in the recent local elections, uh, including uh, winning several uh, mayoral uh, races in, in major cities. Uh, and so I think uh, we would be very interested to get a sense from you. Um, what is what do you think Turkey's uh, grand uh, foreign policy strategy should be from from your perspective and that of CHP? I've also seen you uh, in sort of a number of publications and quite publicly saying that there are differences uh, between approaches on, on issues, uh, foreign policy, Eastern Med, uh, Eastern Mediterranean policy. Um, but then there's also those that argue in the think tank community that perhaps uh, CHP's policy, foreign policy direction is very similar, is really no differences. So I guess maybe I'll start you off with those two questions about what you view as the, you know, sort of the grand strategy um, from the perspective of CHP, but also, you know, whether or not where are the fault lines and differences between, uh, between uh, your party um, and the current party in power today. And so maybe we could start, start off with those two easy questions. Um, but also really, uh, really important for those that are trying to, as Ian said, particularly from Washington or Brussels, with politics changing here, with a new administration coming in, uh, what are those, what are those differences, and and what is the strategy? Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Ian. It's so good to see you all, uh, and uh, it's a great uh, pleasure for me uh, to be invited. And I also thank the GMF for organizing this uh, webinar. Um, uh, Ian has also mentioned uh, the uh, important issues, but particularly between the United States and Turkey, and uh, that it has never been a very easy relationship. Uh, but I think uh, particularly after 2003, uh, it has uh, faced a lot of uh, serious difficulties. Um, Jonathan, the two questions that you have asked uh, actually give me an opportunity to make a, a, a very brief uh, overview about the uh, Republican People's Party's uh, vision for uh, foreign policy. Uh, and uh, I will probably start with uh, uh, mentioning that uh, uh, during the AKP rule, uh, the AKP uh, foreign policy uh, has uh, actually uh, lost uh, three important uh, elements uh, in Turkish foreign policy. These are impartiality, uh, predictability and reliability. And as a result of all these, uh, Turkey uh, has uh, been quite isolated in the international arena uh, among the uh, fellow uh, allies uh, and also in the region, uh, in its immediate neighborhood. So, uh, at the initial phase of the AKP rule, people believe that uh, the Arab street has been supporting Erdogan, uh, but now uh, in many uh, 
uh, Arab countries and in the Middle East and uh, North Africa, uh, Turkey is not seen as, a, uh, as an important uh, role model anymore, uh, but uh, simply uh, as, uh, be, is, is being perceived as a liability, unfortunately. And this is simply because Turkey has lost its impartiality and Turkey started to take sides in the uh, solution of the problems. That, of course, uh, also adds to the uh, loss of uh, predictability. And uh, that also brings the uh, uh, unreliable uh, character of the foreign policy. What will be the uh, Republican People's Party's approach uh, is uh, quite different, actually. And I think uh, I can perhaps summarize it in uh, one uh, sentence. I think uh, Turkey needs to reintegrate with the international community in order to get uh, rid of this isolation. Reintegration with the international community is very important. Multilateralism uh, has to be respected again because uh, the AKP rule uh, has neglected multilateralism and uh, the role that Turkey could play in many international uh, organizations. Respect to international law, of course, is a very important uh, element uh, in uh, being reintegrated with the international community. Respect to the United Nations Security Council resolutions. Uh, I can cite the example of Libya case, for example. Turkey is being seriously criticized by not uh, complying with the uh, United Nations Security Council resolutions on the arms embargo in Libya, for example. Then um, I think Turkey also has to respect to the commitments emanating from its uh, membership uh, to several international organizations. And there, I think uh, the new Biden administration will probably change a lot of things as far as the transatlantic relations are concerned. Uh, the uh, greater transatlantic unity is probably something that all the European allies are uh, seriously looking at. And uh, this will probably be corrected uh, after the parentheses of four years that has been opened by uh, the Trump administration. So uh, not only NATO, uh, but also a commitment of Turkey to the uh, main principles uh, of uh, the Council of Europe, for example, OSCE, United Nations, uh, but also uh, to, uh, uh, to revisit, of course, the Copenhagen criteria in order to uh, continue with the accession process with the European Union. Um, I think uh, here emphasis on dialogue and cooperation is important. Uh, this is something lacking in the Turkish foreign policy conduct during the AKP rule. Respect to international instruments that Turkey is a party. For example, the Republican People's Party uh, argues that Turkey should be signing the Paris Climate Agreement. I mean, uh, should be ratifying the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, the AKP has been uh, uh, quite resistant uh, in taking this issue to the General Assembly of the Parliament and uh, it is unable uh, to, to uh, ratify, but uh, the Republican People's Party is uh, defending the ratification of the Paris Climate Agreement. Respect to diplomatic practice and to diplomatic courtesy and to diplomatic language. Uh, I think uh, the uh, exchange of uh, words uh, between President Macron of France and uh, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan are uh, a case in point, of course. Uh, that is something uh, which is lacking in the Turkish diplomatic practice, uh, the diplomatic courtesy. Uh, so this is something that uh, we would also like to uh, bring back. No more transactionalism. I think uh, transactionalism is harming both uh, the bilateral relations of the United States between United States and Turkey, but also uh, it is harming the EU-Turkey relations. Um, uh, when I come to the uh, relations with the United States, I think uh, with the new Biden administration, uh, there will be a stronger emphasis on the institutional relations between the two countries. Because uh, what Recep Tayyip Erdogan enjoyed was uh, simply uh, to reach out to President Trump uh, by telephone and uh, to carry on the foreign policy issues and all other issues actually in the international uh, relations uh, through the telephone conversation that he had with the White House and uh, with President Trump himself. But uh, I think... Uh, probably President Biden and the new administration will put a more emphasis on the institutional relations, which brings back the uh, state, uh, uh, the, uh, the foreign ministry, of course, and uh, the uh, uh, Pentagon uh, into the uh, game. And uh, that will, of course, allow us to, uh, to build on uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the relations on an institutional basis. Allied coordination, dialogue, and uh, transparency, uh, particularly, uh, in the relations with the United States is absolutely necessary. Uh, I think it is also important to mention that the Biden administration will probably put more emphasis on the rule of law, uh, fundamental rights and freedoms, 
uh, and uh, these will probably be brought to the agenda of the bilateral talks uh, in the meetings. Uh, and uh, this is something that, uh, being, that is being also uh, seriously criticized by the European Union that Turkey is unfortunately drifting away from the rule of law and also is uh, neglecting the fundamental rights and freedoms. Let me, uh, with this introduction, come to the relations with the European Union. Um, I think uh, there is a perception in the European Union, in Brussels, and uh, I, I, I hope Ian will uh, confirm that, uh, that uh, there is a deterioration in the rule of law and in the fundamental rights uh, and freedoms in Turkey. This is the perception in the European Union, which is actually true. And this is also our understanding uh, as the Republican People's Party is concerned. Uh, the foreign policy is becoming increasingly conflictual and uh, is very much inclined to uh, military options. Uh, this is also uh, the perception uh, that the foreign policy conduct of AKP is uh, creating here in, in Brussels, but not only in Brussels, also in the neighborhood, in the, me in the Mediterranean, in the Middle East, and also in our neighborhood. Uh, and uh, all these have to be corrected. So uh, in order to have a respectable, uh, predictable, reliable, impartial foreign policy conduct, I think uh, a lot of things have to be corrected as far as the domestic policy is concerned. And uh, this requires uh, a return to rule of law. Uh, it also requires uh, full separation of powers. Uh, it requires depoliticization of the judiciary. Uh, and of course, uh, as uh, we have always been arguing as the Republican People's Party, we uh, defend that uh, there should be uh, an enhanced parliamentary democracy in our country. Now, um, as far as the Turkish EU relations are concerned, there is also one thing which is very important. And this is also very much related to the fundamental uh, human rights. The review of anti-terrorism uh, legislation uh, has to comply with the international standards and uh, it has to create an effective protection of fundamental rights and freedoms, uh, as well as uh, proportionality and equality before the law. Uh, that uh, has to be guaranteed uh, by the uh, new uh, uh, reform of the judiciary in the, uh, uh, in the country in Turkey. And finally, when I come to the region, uh, what will be different uh, as far as uh, the Republican People's Party's conduct of foreign policy is concerned is uh, uh, a, a very strong emphasis on secularism and uh, the conduct of a secular foreign policy. Because uh, this is also something that we have been observing in the foreign policy conduct of the uh, 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 AKP. Uh, there's a very strong emphasis on uh, uh, Ihwan uh, and relationship with the Muslim Brotherhood. And that actually has uh, created loss of impartiality in the foreign policy conduct of Turkey. This has to change. We are not a country uh, which uh, determines its foreign policy, but not only foreign policy, but it's also domestic policy on a religious basis. Uh, this is a secular country and religion uh, should be uh, actually not used in the foreign policy conduct, but also in the domestic uh, policies as well. I'm not talking about religiousness. Religiousness is something uh, which is present everywhere and uh, every country of course has religious communities. But uh, what I'm referring to is uh, the use of religion for uh, political purposes. And I think uh, there is a growing perception that uh, the AKP rule has introduced, introduced uh, political Islam into uh, Turkish uh, foreign policy and that has to change. And this is something which will be uh, entirely different uh, under the uh, Republican People's Party's vision of foreign policy. We will have to establish uh, uh, good relations, good diplomatic relations and upgrade our relations with Israel and Egypt to the level of ambassadors. Uh, we don't have an ambassador in Cairo since 2013. Uh, we don't have an ambassador in uh, Israel since 2018, but before that, uh, between 2010 and 2016, we had a, a very long period of break here of ambassadorial level diplomatic representation uh, with Israel for six years. Uh, it had been corrected, uh, but uh, after two years, it has been interrupted again. So I think uh, all these issues are probably the issues that probably I can uh, mention uh, in a nutshell uh, in response to your uh, two uh, introductory questions. Ambassador, thank you. Um, I think you, you touched on a number of issues and, and that I think we want to sort of peel back a little bit further. Um, you, you started, you, you did mention, and, and I think um, uh, on, the, on the side of the U.S., there's a new administration, which Ian also mentioned, uh, President-elect Biden coming in. 
uh, you touched on some some areas where you think that 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 you think, from your perspective, the Biden administration might uh, engage Turkey on. You mentioned uh, such issues as as democracy and human rights, which I, I agree, which has been a cornerstone of of what the Biden uh, uh, Biden uh, team has talked a lot about: uh, democracy, countering corruption, um, as well, but also rebuilding the transatlantic security uh, infrastructure, NATO. Uh, and strengthening these ties. And of course, Turkey uh, plays such an important role and has in, in NATO. I guess my question for you is, where do you think there are opportunities um, if you're looking sort of ahead, where are the opportunities for engagement uh, between uh, the United States and Turkey? Um, and if you were, you know, just, uh, you know, obviously uh, Ian mentioned the S-400 situation. Uh, you know, this is uh, regardless of uh, administration, uh, both Republicans and Democrats in Washington, including the U.S. Congress, feel very deeply and concerned about about this issue. Uh, do you have some thoughts on maybe a way forward uh, to address these issues? And then uh, because obviously one of the things that's been on the table has been uh, has been sanctions. Uh, and uh, and it's a you know cats of sanctions which are directly connected to the sale of these of these weapons with Russia, uh, and so I'm just wondering. I think for for many of those here, it's been it's been an issue that has really uh, really been a, a difficult one to try to address. I think there's also a recognition for many here that uh, that Turkey's economy is in an incredibly difficult moment, incredibly difficult, and has been for the last couple of years, um, and. Um, so I think there's a sensitivity to the idea of how do you help the Turkish people uh, from the United States uh, maybe focus a little bit more on economic side of the relationship um, and then also uh, recognize that U.S. policy can impact uh, Turkey's economy. And that's something that, uh, unfortunately, I thought President Trump was quite um, cavalier about and also, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, was used uh, via Twitter and other ways to hurt Turkey's economy in a way that that wasn't helpful. So maybe you could just address that, th those questions of opportunities with a new administration. Where should the Biden administration look? Where can Turkey look? Um, and then maybe within that, the S-400 question, which on the U.S. side has been sort of really the a major, major sticking point. And I know that it's important from the perspective of Ankara as well. So if I could send that mm -hmm. back over to you, and then I can see we have a number of questions already in the queue uh, waiting, uh, waiting to be posed to. So why don't we start with my initial question, and then we'll, we'll get to the questions from those who are participating today. Yes, thank you, Jonathan. Very briefly, uh, I think uh, what are the opportunities as far as NATO and transatlantic relations is concerned is uh, a stronger transatlantic unity. Uh, this was lacking during the Trump administration and uh, Biden administration and also uh, all the allies in Europe are very much looking forward to re-establishing the transatlantic relations between the United States and the European Union. Certainly, uh, the European Union has developed its own defense uh, policies and defense capabilities. Uh, it's not going to be a, 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 an asymmetrical relationship anymore. Uh, but uh, we have to rebuild uh, this strong relationship between the United States and uh, Europe uh, to have a strong uh, transactional unity. This will also uh, determine uh, the relations uh, of NATO uh, with Russia, uh, but also uh, with other uh, emerging powers such as China, for example. And uh, if we have a strong transatlantic unity, uh, which certainly will bring back Turkey into the uh, community of uh, NATO members. Uh, that will also uh, comply with the NATO policies and uh, probably uh, Turkey will be in a very delicate situation uh, that it used to have during the Cold War. Turkey was probably one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, few NATO countries or perhaps probably was the only one which had uh, decent relationships with the Soviet Union but which did not uh, negatively influence or uh, have an impact on NATO strategy and NATO relations at all. Uh, but today, uh, when uh, our NATO allies look at Turkey's rapprochement with Russia, they uh, simply and very legitimately ask the question uh, whether Turkey is drifting apart from NATO and uh, getting uh, closer uh, and looking for a new 
strategic alliance with Russia and also perhaps China. This is not the case, uh, but uh, I think we have to show that it is not the case. How can we show that and how can we do that? Uh, let, us, uh, let us look at the S-400 situation. Uh, the uh, chairman of our party, Kemal Kovacdaroğlu, very frequently mentions that the S-400 uh, is probably uh, going to be considered as the most expensive junk in the Turkish history. Uh, and why does he say that? Uh, because uh, it is uh, not uh, interoperable with the NATO system. Uh, and uh, the 2.5 billion US dollars, which has been already paid, is uh, probably not going to uh, uh, be efficient because S-400s will not be operable. Uh, they cannot be integrated into the NATO system. They cannot be used as a, a standalone system because this will also contradict to the existing NATO infrastructure and uh, for the defense of the uh, NATO airspace, this will create some complications. As a result of this, uh, Turkey, unfortunately, has been excluded from a very important strategic project, which is called the F-35 project. I think um, non-operational uh, status of S-400 uh, is probably going to come to the agenda of the government. And if it doesn't, it will come definitely to the agenda of the next government, which will be led by the Republican People's Party. Uh, so that uh, if it happens, then... Uh, we expect uh, Turkey to, uh, to move back to the F-35 project uh, and to benefit from the uh, uh, strategic opportunities that it has created for Turkey and for Turkey's uh, defense uh, uh, industry. Uh, I think these are the opportunities. There is also uh, a new attempt, of course, uh, to uh, rewrite the new NATO uh, strategic concept uh, and uh, to look at what NATO's role could be in the new environment uh, of the 21st century. Uh, Turkey is, of course, going to contribute to that, uh, to the formation of the new strategic concept. And I think Turkey has a very important role to play in the new strategic concept of NATO. Uh, Turkey has been quite efficient in non-Article 5 missions uh, in Kosovo, for example, in Afghanistan, and uh, uh, formerly, of course, in Bosnia. Uh, but uh, when we redefine the role of the uh, new NATO concept and the new NATO strategy, I'm sure Turkey, uh, with its all capacity and uh, with its... Uh, not only the military power and not only the hard power, but with its smart power, will be a very efficient uh, uh, NATO uh, partner. This is something that I want to uh, underline as far as uh, the S-400 issue and uh, the uh, possibilities that we may look for uh, in the uh, future Turkish-US relations related to transatlantic uh, link. Uh, Ambassador, thank you on that. And, and, Did I miss and anything? Did I miss anything? Was it all right? I mean. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you know, and we can sort of build on it. We have a number of, uh, of, of questions as well. Um, some of them are, are more regional uh, as well. But I think that this, I'm sure we're going to come back to this, these questions of, of sort of the U.S. relationship and, and with, with Ankara, um, but also um, the, the EU-Turkish uh, relationship. I mean, both of them uh, have dramatically changed in the last 10 years. Ian, mentioned that the things have never been golden. And I've, I've, I've seen this sort of up close, um, sort of there's, there's no golden age, but there was, there's clearly a difference today than there was even a decade ago in terms of the relationship. Uh, but I wanted to get to some of the questions and, and a lot of them um, are really in sort of uh, or Turkey's neighborhood. I had one question though, that was more domestic in nature, which I'll, I'll get to um, in a second. Uh, but, but, but a question, a couple of things, um, one, um, you've obviously had a tremendous experience in, in the South Caucasus region um, and, um, and in terms of Turkey's relationship, both with Armenia and Azerbaijan. And I, one of the questions posed is how, how, does, you know, how do you see Turkey's current position in the, in the Caucasus region? I assume it's been South Caucasus. Um, and can Turkey strengthen its position in NATO by using its recent uh, success in, in the region? So I wanted to ask you one about uh, about that, and I wanted to just because we're if we flip to to geographically to to just to the Med uh, Mediterranean uh, question posed about, um, and this is very specific to uh, to Cyprus uh, because we've all seen um, uh, recent uh, uh, announcements by uh, President Erdogan regarding uh, you know regarding a two state solution. Um, statements on Verosha, and I guess the question is, what what is what approach 
uh, would your party take CHP with respect to the Cyprus question? Um, you know, and, and what are your views on, on President Erdogan's recent statements on Varosha, Cyprus uh, during his recent visit there? So maybe we'll just start with those two, you know, two two questions because they're you know they're areas that you've spent a lot of time focused on, and and also um, there is a great deal of interest, as you can imagine, uh, both here in Washington, Brussels, and elsewhere on these issues, and it goes to the heart of your initial statement about strategy within uh, Eastern Mediterranean. But some of these issues, like Cyprus, have been long outstanding. Uh, these aren't new issues. Um, but they're also ones that are creating enormous uh, friction in the relationship between uh, uh, Turkey and uh, the EU, um, and in some cases with other partners. So if I can mm -hmm. send those two questions to you. About the Caucasus, uh, and particularly about the NK, uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh problem, uh, I don't think that NATO has uh, any role to play in that uh, conflict and uh, in that uh, frozen conflict. Uh, and uh, I don't think that Turkey's position uh, in the Caucasus uh, will uh, uh, have uh, a, a positive uh, role uh, to enhance its position in NATO. Uh, the Caucasus issue, and particularly the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, is uh, not uh, a, a serious agenda item for NATO, and uh, Russia uh, will never allow it to happen. Uh, but what has happened in, uh, in the Caucasus uh, in the last 45 days is uh, amazing. Uh, but uh, I think uh, we have to also underline here that uh, Russia uh, has uh, uh, come back to the region very seriously. Uh, when we look at all the post-Soviet frozen conflicts, uh, all of them are bilateral problems uh, between the uh, uh, mainland country and Russia. Uh, it is the case with Transdiniester issue, for example, uh, Russia-Moldova problem. It's the case with Crimea and Donbass region, Russia-Ukraine problem. Is the case with Abkhazia, South Ossetia, is a, a Russia Georgia problem. Uh, but the only difference uh, that Nagorno Karabakh had uh, was uh, it did not involve Russia uh, 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 directly. It was a bilateral problem between Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, at the end of 45 days, I think Azerbaijan is a big winner uh, because uh, it has liberated uh, all the occupied seven regions uh, around Nagorno Karabakh. Uh, four of them have been liberated uh, by the military operation. Uh, the remaining three are now uh, gradually being returned to the Azerbaijani uh, forces. Agdam has been returned uh, today, and uh, Kalbajar and Lachin uh, will return. Turkey has supported, uh, of course, uh, Azerbaijan's just uh, operation uh, because uh, we believe that uh, it was uh, an unfair situation uh, to keep the uh, more than 20% of the Azerbaijani territory under the Armenian occupation for uh, close to 30 years. So uh, Russia also allowed Azerbaijan uh, to uh, carry out the military operation to liberate its occupied territories. But now uh, there's a very important significant difference here. Russia has entered uh, into the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and uh, has deployed its troops just like in the other frozen conflicts in Moldova, in Ukraine or in Georgia between the Azeri forces and the Armenian forces and uh, stopped actually the uh, moving forward of Azerbaijani army uh, to enter into Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, Azerbaijan, of course, militarily has uh, made a big success and won a victory uh, and liberated its seven regions, but uh, the status of Nagorno-Karabakh is, is still undetermined and uh, it is uh, not clear what will happen. And in the ceasefire agreement, nothing is mentioned about the future of the uh, talks and negotiations for the resolution of Nagorno-Karabakh. Turkey will continue, and this is also the attitude of our party, Turkey will continue to support uh, the uh, Azerbaijani uh, uh, cause and case uh, for uh, uh, finalizing uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, problem. But from now on, I think uh, the issue is going to be uh, on the uh, 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 on the diplomatic uh, front uh, through negotiations. As far as Cyprus is concerned, um, we made it very clear that uh, we do not approve uh, the partial opening of Varosha. It is contrary uh, and it is against the United Nations Security Council's resolutions. Uh, we certainly uh, defend uh, the opening of Varosha uh, because uh, it is important and uh, uh, we believe that uh, it should be opened uh, according to the international law and according to the uh, regulations and the resolutions which have been uh, 
uh, passed in the United Nations Security Council. Uh, uh, and this is something that we particularly emphasize. We did not uh, support the partial opening, uh, but uh, we believe that uh, uh, a time will come and uh, when uh, Varosha is opened, uh, it will be a fair opening, uh, which will of course allow the uh, previous property owners uh, to uh, have a, a possibility of obtaining their properties or reaching out to their properties. Now, the, the two-state solution is uh, one of the uh, formulae uh, which are uh, on the agenda. Uh, we cannot say that it is the only solution. Uh, it is unfortunate that uh, in 2017, that the meeting in Crown Montana uh, could not find a solution uh, to the uh, federal resolution of the Cyprus problem. Uh, but uh, all the parties agreed that uh, at the end of Crown Montana, uh, they said uh, all the options are now open and all the other formulae and all the other alternatives should be on the desk, on the table uh, to be discussed and negotiated. This is the approach of the Republican People's Party. We do not uh, exclusively defend that the two-state solution is the only solution, uh, but uh, we defend that uh, the main important element here is the equality of the two communities. Uh, if uh, the solution is based on the equality of two communities, the Greek Cypriots and the uh, uh, Turks, uh, Cypriot Turks, uh, then uh, we can approve of the uh, solution. This solution could be a federal solution, uh, a bisonal, bicommunal uh, federal solution, but based on the equality, uh, total equality of the two communities. It could be a confederation or it could be a two-state solution. Uh, this is the uh, position of the Republican People's Party. Thank you. I, I, I want to just come back to um, uh, 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 to the issue of Armenia and Azerbaijan and NK. <clears throat> and I think one of the questions that, that was posed uh, uh, posed to you uh, and by one of those uh, those that are joining us in the audience was really about and participating uh, was about the border issues. Do you and I think this goes to I think a question that many have about whether or not one, there's a lot of unknown still within the agreement that was reached and the implementation of that agreement. Um, also, the lack of, um, of, of, of sort of international community engagement, which I think will come, both, both OSCE and UN, which I think should be part of this, <laughs> by my own opinion, I'm, I'm projecting myself. <clears throat> but one of the questions has been, you know, the borders have been closed um, and largely connected. And so the question was asked, was closed due to Armenia's occupation of, of these territories in Azerbaijan. Now that a deal has been, has been struck, can we expect in the future uh, you know, to, to take this moment and sort of move forward on opening of borders between Turkey and Armenia? Um, how do you see the vision for that, for the, really for the South Caucasus, now that, that this issue, you know, far from still being resolved, because you mentioned the issue, the final status of NK itself is still unresolved. Uh, but I think a lot of people are starting to think that perhaps there might be an opportunity to, uh, you know, to, to tackle some of, the, uh, some of the challenging issues of reconciliation um, that have been attempted previously uh, and sort of opening, uh, opening of, of borders uh, certainly is, is a significant one. Uh, but also that I think the thinking is too that if you have a region that is interconnected, uh, you know, with Turkey uh, as an economic anchor as well with other partners, uh, that perhaps that really actually in some sense is not a very positive situation uh, for Moscow because it changes the dynamics and needs. Right now, there's a dependency, particularly on Russia and Armenia economically uh, and for security. If the dynamics change and the region is open, democratic, and connected, uh, that that there's a real opportunity for change. But I the question posed to you was was about this potential from taking the current moment and perhaps seeing something a broader vision, uh, and maybe that's a bridge too far. I'm certain in certain quarters, whether it be in Baku or Yerevan right now, or even in Ankara. But I, I guess the question is really posed to you: what you, what do you think? Very uh, briefly, let us uh, go back to the history of the event. Uh, uh, the Turkish Armenian border was closed on the 3rd of April 1993 uh, because of the occupation of Kelbejar region uh, of Azerbaijan. Now, uh, when we look at the uh, ceasefire agreement, 
uh, Kelbejar uh, is going to be uh, liberated uh, on the, um, the 20th of November, which is today. Uh, but I think there has been a delay and uh, uh, the Azeri side uh, gave another two weeks of uh, option and it has prolonged uh, uh, the period. Uh, now, when we look at the ceasefire agreement, uh, the ceasefire agreement also uh, establishes a kind of an exchange of two corridors, uh, the Lachin corridor between Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh and also a corridor to be established between Nakhichevan and uh, the mainland of Azerbaijan or the western provinces of Azerbaijan. Now, these two uh, corridors are uh, certainly uh, opening of the main communication and transport lines between the two countries. Uh, the ceasefire agreement uh, is not a peace agreement. It is a ceasefire agreement. Uh, this has to be transformed into a kind of a peace agreement, but it will take time because uh, uh, there are certain deadlines in the uh, uh, ceasefire agreement. For example, the Lachin Corridor uh, will be established uh, uh, by means of constructing all the transport and communication li links uh, in a period of three years. Uh, the Russian forces are going to remain uh, in their place uh, uh, between uh, uh, the occupied territories of Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh for at least for five years. They will be uh, controlling the Lachin Corridor uh, if the Nakhichevan corridor is established, uh, they will also have the control in the Nakhichevan corridor, uh, which will pass through the Armenian territory. Now, uh, uh, in a holistic approach, normally, uh, if uh, this ceasefire agreement and the uh, subsequent uh, negotiations uh, for the future of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, transform into a kind of a, a stable and lasting uh, peace agreement, uh, it goes without saying that uh, this will certainly require the opening of the Turkish-Armenian border. Uh, and there comes the role that Turkey can play. Uh, actually, it could be a very important element uh, to uh, bring a, a stable and a lasting peace to the region if Turkey uh, could introduce its uh, soft power and smart power uh, by adding to that uh, uh, multivariable uh, equation uh, the uh, relations between Turkey and Armenia. Uh, if this is added uh, to the uh, uh, equation, it could uh, perhaps uh, bring uh, a, a very uh, uh, reasonable solution to the whole region. Uh, I can perhaps recall the 2008 uh, Turkish initiative, the Caucasus uh, uh, Peace and Stability uh, Platform. Uh, this uh, was of course invol involving three plus two uh, 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 format, uh, the three Caucasus countries, uh, South Caucasus countries, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, plus uh, Russia and Turkey. Uh, we can perhaps revisit uh, that uh, uh, Caucasus uh, stability and uh, uh, peace platform. Uh, but of course, uh, this uh, has to uh, have uh, two major elements. First, uh, the ceasefire agreement uh, has to evolve into uh, at least uh, at least it has to give some hope that it will evolve into a, a lasting peace agreement. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it is uh, possible, uh, then I am sure uh, Turkey will always uh, uh, be a, a very important contributor to this lasting peace. Uh, and uh, the uh, Turkish-Armenian relations and opening of the Turkish-Armenian uh, border could be a very important element uh, to give a momentum uh, to the uh, reaching out of the uh, lasting peace in the region. Thank you. Um, and I think this is an important point, important uh, topic to sort of build on. And and I, I appreciate the sort of the connection between the, the, the ceasefire to a uh, to an agreement. I get one of the questions that we received, um, and I'm going to just sort of bring it back to um, also to um, to the United States. And the question posed to you is, what can the uh, the new Biden administration offer to Turkey that the Trump administration has not to mend and reset the relationship with Turkey? And, and you know, are there things that you can point to that 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 could be offered? Democracy. Uh, I think uh, the uh, the first uh, expectation that we would have uh, from the uh, Biden administration is to put uh, a very strong emphasis on uh, rule of law, on democracy, and uh, on the uh, depoliticization of the judiciary, separation of powers, and uh, to uh, introduce all the democratic uh, reforms and uh, uh, to introduce media freedom, uh, to introduce uh, uh, 
freedom of expression, uh, freedom of gathering, and uh, uh, all kinds of fundamental rights and freedoms. This is uh, something that uh, the United States and the new Biden administration uh, could ask Turkey uh, to introduce uh, and, of course, in return, uh, enhance the trade relations, because uh, this, uh, uh, this is something uh, uh, which is very important between Turkey and the United States. Uh, there is an enormous opportunity of enhanced trade relations, uh, and I think uh, Trump administration has been, uh, in a way, uh, quite uh, protective uh, uh, in the uh, global trade uh, relationship. Uh, Biden administration is probably going to open uh, uh, the global trade relations, and uh, it may also have an opportunity to talk back to the TTIP, uh, the transatlantic trade and investment uh, partnership between uh, Europe and uh, the United States. All these will uh, also uh, give an opportunity to uh, enhance the Turkish-American uh, trade relations. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there is a conditioning here, and uh, I think my party is very serious on, on that conditioning. Uh, the United States has to look at Turkey uh, from a perspective of democracy. Uh, thank you for that. And, and, and just as I'm seeing that, uh, Ian, I, I, you know, this is a question too for you, and I, I think it uh, just wanted to maybe bring you into. It was a question about what what could the Biden administration offer Turkey versus that of of the Trump administration. The ambassador uh, raises this issue. Raises the issue of, of sort of engaging on democracy and on rule of law. Um, and I think it's interesting enough because I see President Erdogan sort of saying we need to sort of do more in this space because it's impacting the economy, um, that it has a direct impact because of, of the issues of, of corruption and other issues too. Uh, but maybe you have some, a couple of thoughts too on where you see, um, you know, uh, and, I, and I think I would include Brussels because when we talk about economy, the, you know, the trading part into that is, is so important for uh, for Turkey is its its European partners uh, as well. That makes up a, a big percentage of the trade uh, trade relationship. Uh, Jonathan, thank you very much. And I, I agree very much with what uh, Ambassador Jevigos has said about this. Um, I mean, the democracy agenda, I think, is very important. I think it will absolutely be part of the Biden broader foreign policy agenda, but, but also in the engagement with Turkey. Now, whether it's received well by this current government in Ankara, I, you know, I'm not so, I'm not that sanguine about, to be honest. I'm not sure that's going to be a, a great sort of area for, um, for sort of convergence, but I think it's important to make those points. I fully agree with the ambassador about it. Um, I think there are some other things um, that can be offered. I made this point sort of at the very beginning about, you know, the United States being an an essential partner, I think, for Turkey in what is likely to be a very sort of durable set of chaotic situations on Turkey's borders. That's not going away anytime soon. And someone is going to have to provide, is going to have to help Turkey with that. You can't just be a lone wolf in relation to those contingencies. If you're talking about Syria, you're talking about many other things in the Levant, in North Africa, uh, in relations with Russia. Um, you know, that's NATO, but it's also at base also with the United States. So I think that's part of it in the longer term. I think the United States can play a key role in getting NATO focused, more focused on strategy looking south, where most of the contingencies, frankly, for NATO globally, but certainly in the south, uh, involve Turkey. And, you know, the U.S., a, a U.S. that is, has a, a sort of keener appreciation for NATO, let me put it that way, uh, you know, a more explicit one, um, and I think that's coming, would be in a better position to do that. I think there are some other areas uh, on Iran where probably the Biden administration will have um, uh, a different perspective, especially on the nuclear side, which probably fits with Turkey's agenda uh, as well. Uh, multiple administrations have tried to build up the trade and investment side of the relationship. Surely are things that can be done, but one thing that probably we can do is to help a better relationship between the United States and Turkey will reduce the kind of net strategic risk for investors in Turkey. And, you know, if that can be done, you can then rapidly move into a setting where investors, whether from Europe or Asia or the United States are gonna have more confidence about investing in, in Turkey. Certainly we have no, we will have no interest in harming the Turkish economy. If sanctions are still on the table over S-400s and things of that nature, um, that may be unavoidable, 
but we certainly shouldn't go the route of trying to directly harm the Turkish economy. They, they could be things related to defense cooperation or other things, but you know, to actually threaten to harm the Turkish economy, a NATO ally um, is certainly not the way to go. So part of, yeah, there's a limited set of things I think we can do. It requires an appreciation for the broader longer term value of the relationship, but it also involves not doing harmful things. And I think, I hope the administration coming in will take that kind of a view. Thank you, Ian. <clears throat> Thank you for highlighting those points. And, and I think when we talk about, we were talking about investment in Turkey and <coughs> economic, not only with the betterment of the, of the US-Turkish relationship impact Turkey, potentially impact Turkey's economy, but the issue of democracy and rule of law as key to investors looking at Turkey um, is also really important. Ambassador, can I bring in two other questions that, that, um, that, that uh, I think others are sort of wondering about? One is Syria and the approach of, um, of, of CHP uh, towards Syria. Um, and uh, maybe just talk a little bit about what you see as, um, as, you know, as, a, as a strategy there, obviously, of, of real concern, also an area where uh, President Trump and, and President Erdogan have uh, concluded actions over telephone calls. Uh, it's been a, uh, something of controversy here in the U.S. Uh, and obviously, there's still, you know, always these, the issue of, 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 of Kurdish policy and sort of approach and sort of interested to hear about that on the CHP side. Then also just another sort of geographic uh, question for you uh, would be the Black Sea. Um, there's been discussion of a, of a NATO Black Sea uh, fleet, something that Romania has championed. Um, and, you know, what would be uh, the position of and, and viewpoint of, of CHP if in power, um, you know, to, uh, is that something that, 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 that you would consider to be a priority uh, in the Black Sea region? So two questions, one, uh, uh, Syria, uh, but then also turning up into sort of Black Sea region, uh, a Black Sea fleet and thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think uh, uh, Ian has uh, made a very important contribution about the uh, Syria issue. Uh, and uh, he mentioned the uh, Turkish-US bilateral relations uh, uh, to develop in the sense that uh, Turkey could be comforted uh, by the United States uh, by uh, giving Turkey some security guarantees uh, in its southern borders, and that, of course, involves Syria and also, to a certain extent, uh, uh, Iraq. Uh, I think uh, the Syria issue is very much related to the Kurdish issue. Uh, let me start with the Kurdish issue. Uh, first of all, uh, I have to underline that the Republican People's Party has a, a very serious vision uh, for the resolution of the Kurdish issue. Uh, it's a matter of human rights issue, and uh, it's a matter of uh, internal historic conciliation, uh, reconciliation uh, of the uh, Turkish population. Uh, we missed an opportunity in 2015, unfortunately, when he, we had uh, uh, this dialogue uh, uh, process uh, for the resolution of the Kurdish issue. Uh, but uh, if uh, the Turkish administrations, uh, either the current one or in the future, uh, the next coming one, uh, cannot deal with the Kurdish issue domestically and uh, by its own uh, 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 capabilities and possibilities, I'm afraid uh, the solution will be imposed to Turkey from abroad. And this is something that we do not approve of. Also, uh, this is the reason why uh, we uh, pay a very big importance to the resolution of the Kurdish issue by a Turkish government, but the resolution should be in the Turkish Grand National Assembly and in the Turkish parliament. Uh, the uh, issue here is uh, there is a growing uh, perception in the Turkish population that uh, the AKP rule uh, has uh, condemned uh, the Kurds uh, uh, as uh, always being linked uh, to the PKK terrorism. This is not something that we approve of. We have to make a distinction between the PKK terrorism and our uh, fellow Kurdish origin uh, citizens and the Kurdish community that we have also in the neighboring countries, such as in Iraq and Syria. Uh, this is something that uh, we have to uh, uh, develop for seriously the relations between the uh, uh, Kurdish relatives of our uh, Kurdish origin citizens in Iraq, uh, in Syria, 
uh, is very important. And if we can establish this, and if we can look at it uh, from this human rights point of view on an equality basis, uh, then uh, we will be able to resolve the uh, terrorism issue. Uh, I think uh, uh, the, the uh, Syria issue has two aspects. Uh, one is, of course, the east of the Euphrates, and the other one is Idlib. Idlib is currently a very serious uh, situation because it is developing uh, very bad. Uh, we have insisted that uh, Turkey should move back its observation points to, to the north of M4 and M5 uh, uh, motorways uh, as early as possible. Uh, but uh, since Turkey did not uh, realize its commitments uh, taken in the Sochi agreement in 2018 September between Russia and Turkey, uh, Turkey has suffered uh, in February this year uh, by uh, giving some 40 martyrs uh, in Idlib. And this is simply because uh, Turkey did not realize its commitments and did not uh, 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 bring uh, a very uh, uh, convincing uh, delivery uh, uh, to its commitments. Uh, this is simply because Turkey is still uh, having the difficulty of getting rid of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood to approach uh, to the problems of the region. This has to change. And if you look at it uh, from a, uh, an impartial uh, point of view, I think uh, there's a lot of opportunities to uh, develop in Syria. And this is something that the Republican People's Party uh, defends. So the Kurdish issue and the Syria issue are very much connected. We believe that uh, as soon as the uh, Syrian security forces uh, and as soon as the democratic transformation of Syria happens, uh, as soon as the Syrian security forces guarantee the security and stability in their country, Turkey's troops uh, should withdraw, of course. So it is not uh, going to remain uh, as if uh, it were some kind of an occupation uh, in Syria. This is a wrong perception. We do not want to give that kind of a perception to the international community. The reason why there are Turkish troops there is certainly because of the Astana process and uh, the agreement between uh, Russia and Turkey. Uh, but uh, when uh, the resolution is found in Syria, uh, this has to uh, come to an end. It is also related to the Syrian refugees. Turkey has more than 4 million uh, refugees uh, in Turkey. Uh, and uh, this is also uh, a very big burden. The refugee issue is also very much connected to the, the final uh, status of the Syrian issue. We believe that uh, all those people if they choose to do so, uh, should have an opportunity to go back to their homeland. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, proper uh, and uh, welfare conditions uh, have to be re-established in their country so that they can move back safely and uh, uh, re-establish their lives uh, there. Um, as far as the Black Sea fleet issue and the NATO's role in the Black Sea is concerned, I think there are three NATO countries uh, uh, in, in Black Sea. Uh, there is Romania, Bulgaria and Turkey. Uh, and uh, also uh, Ukraine uh, is to a, a great extent uh, uh, very close to the NATO policies, uh, although it's not a member of NATO. So there is a balance there. And uh, I think this balance uh, should not be uh, uh, disrupted uh, because uh, uh, it would uh, or it could uh, in a way uh, become a provocative uh, move uh, from the perspective of Russia. And uh, we have to uh, establish the balances in the Black Sea region, which is a close sea, and uh, which is controlled by the Turkish Straits uh, to open to the Aegean and the Mediterranean. Uh, this uh, has to give some kind of a, a, a priority to the position that Turkey has uh, as far as the Black Sea security is concerned. If we uh, introduce uh, some uh, stronger NATO elements in the Black Sea, uh, it could become a very serious provocative uh, uh, development uh, from the Russian point of view. And uh, I think uh, as we were talking about the NK and the Caucasus, I, I uh, underlined uh, the frozen conflicts. Uh, I think uh, Russia sees uh, the former Soviet territory uh, as a forbidden fruit. And uh, that's the reason why we are facing all these frozen conflicts. Uh, and that's the reason why we are uh, having some serious difficulty in the Russian-Ukraine relations. Uh, we have to be careful uh, in our relations with Russia. Uh, Russia is an immediate neighbor uh, to Turkey. Uh, but of course, uh, in the grand strategy, uh, as far as the uh, transatlantic uh, links are concerned and the role that NATO uh, plays uh, in our region, uh, we have to look at the future of NATO-Russia relations from this point of view. Turkey has a very important role to play in the Black Sea. And I think uh, Turkey, Bulgaria and Romania uh, are uh, 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 quite sufficient uh, to balance uh, the Russian role uh, that uh, it could play in the Black Sea. 
Ambassador, thank you. We're 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 at the top of the hour, and um, I think you've you've touched on a number of uh, a number of key issues. I think also highlighting that Turkey's foreign policy is is clearly uh, I use the word monolithic. That there are a lot of different voices uh, in the opposition party, which is is I think. Uh, you mentioned that you know you you envision in the future that you know that the party you know will will be in power. That could happen. We all know how elections are are dicey, even in the United States right now. We're still uh, still dealing with the aftermath of our of our own election, and which you guys have also had challenges to previously on on elections. Uh, and how important it is to have free, fair, and transparent elections uh, going forward, uh, including a stronger uh, Turkish democracy, which is something I think you think is something that's both possible and doable. Um, I wanted to just maybe give you one minute to close any final thoughts that you have, and you've really been very kind with your time, but I thought uh, we wanted to, you know, give you the final word before we sign off. And again, from um, on behalf of GMF, as, as someone who's worked uh, and engaged with GMF for many years, we really appreciate you taking the time in the, in the, in the middle of a busy uh, parliamentary season of budgets and, and COVID-19 to be with us. But any final thoughts on on how you see Turkish foreign policy and, and its partnerships, particularly with the United States and, and, and European partners. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I think uh, I have mentioned the importance of the transatlantic links. Uh, I mentioned the importance that Turkey has to reestablish uh, uh, its bilateral relations uh, with the United States. Uh, Turkey has to enhance uh, its uh, political framework uh, for uh, accession negotiations with the European Union. And uh, for all these, uh, Turkey needs to uh, revisit the domestic politics uh, and Turkey has to give reassurance to all its partners and to the whole international community that uh, it is a country of rule of law, uh, that it respects uh, full separation of powers, uh, that uh, uh, there will be a depoliticization of the judiciary because all these will uh, reassure the financial uh, circles and foreign direct investments will uh, start to come back to Turkey. Uh, this will certainly uh, help uh, the Turkish economy to recover. And as far as uh, the foreign policy issue is concerned, uh, I, I think uh, I, I, I have a magic 3D formula. Uh, that is uh, um, uh, decency, uh, dignity and diplomacy. Uh, dignity in the sense that uh, Turkey should not give away any of its legitimate uh, rights uh, emanating from the international law, but also uh, should uh, respect to the dignity of all the other counterparts uh, in the international arena. Decency, uh, Turkey should uh, always follow uh, decent uh, foreign policy uh, approaches, uh, and uh, Turkey should uh, also use uh, a decent diplomatic language. And that's the reason why I uh, uh, use the third D as diplomacy. Uh, Turkey should always give a priority to uh, resolution of conflicts through peaceful methods. And for that, uh, diplomacy is very important. That is my uh, 3D magic formula. Thank you for sharing the, the 3D magic formula. I think I'm gonna steal that from you in, uh, <laughs> in terms of uh, <laughs> terminology. Uh, I, again, thank you so much. I also wanna thank uh, uh, Ian Lesser, my colleague in Brussels as well. And, um, who's been uh, writing a lot? My also colleagues that you know, sort of across Europe, that are focused on uh, the the transatlantic relationship with Turkey. Uh, no doubt, Ambassador, there's going to be a lot of uh, of engagement, uh, particularly with the new U.S. administration coming in. Uh, you will also have a, a number of challenges ahead of you, uh, and I also wish you and uh, uh, you and your family and others to be safe. Uh, given the COVID nineteen pandemic, we're all in this together. And we look forward to the next opportunity to speak with you uh, regarding uh, the, the U.S.-Turkish relationship, but also Turkey's foreign policy priorities going forward. So to everybody, uh, your evening, uh, if you're in, in Ankara, I think we're getting close to, to evening there. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Jim. And thank uh, you, Jonathan. Thank we you, hope Ian. everybody stays safe. Thank you. Take care.